Hi, hello, hi. So, I want to make a mini-series on top surgery. The reason being that I recently stumbled across my old top surgery videos and my top surgery reveal and things I've never posted online. And one of my really good friends recently just had top surgery, Ash. I'm so happy for you. And it's just resurfaced a lot of my old feelings and I just feel like this will be important. So the way I'm gonna break down the videos is, firstly, in today's video, I wanna talk about being the person being taken care of and my advice to you as that person receiving the aid. The next video is going to be how to be a caretaker to your loved one having surgery. And then I would like to also talk about mental health, so things like body dysmorphia, gender dysphoria, and top surgery, and how those three interact, and how top surgery could trigger an eating disorder, how that happens to me, and stuff like that, and you know, just to help prepare people. So I realize I can't put this all in one video, I can't even put the first two parts in a video. I just tried and the video was 15 minutes long and, and that's with me like running through the information. So today's video is my video giving you advice as a person receiving top surgery and how to communicate. So when I had top surgery, I wasn't prepared for the vulnerability that I was going to experience. I didn't realize how much I would rely on the people around me. And I also didn't realize that not everyone is ready to take care of you in the way that you need to be taken care of. Um, you might be disappointed when you have surgery. I, I've spoken to a lot of people who had post-op depression and one of the biggest reasons why they experienced their post-op depression was because they felt really let down by their loved ones and they felt really isolated and like they lost control while they were recovering and it's it could be really traumatic. So my biggest piece of advice to you as a person receiving help and post-op care is communicate. You really, really, really need to communicate not only your needs, but your feelings. If the people taking care of you are doing something that makes you uncomfortable or are making you feel bad or any of that, if you feel like there's a lack of communication or you're not being taken care of in the way that you need, you have to tell them. It's so important. If you tell them and then they're mean to you and all this stuff, if all of those worst case scenarios do play out, then you face that when it happens. But you can't just assume that they'll react a certain way without even giving them the chance to understand how you're feeling. So you need to communicate with them. I realized when I had top surgery that I have a lot of guilt surrounding being taken care of. And I have a really, really deeply rooted fear of abandonment. And that goes back to like when I was 17, as some of you might know, I was disowned and I had legal guardians because I was still not technically an adult. And then those legal guardians disowned me when they found out that I was dating their daughter. So I was literally disowned twice in a very short amount of time and I had to experience having to beg the people that you love, like your parents, the people who you think will always love you more than anyone else and that they'll never give up on you. Having to beg those people not to give up on you and having them actually leave you is really, really traumatic. I'm not here to point fingers or play the blame game or any of that. I'm not here to bring up things that have happened or make anyone feel bad. So I'm not being specific about like which parent and what happened and like I'm not going into the, the logistics of it, but it's it was something that affected my top surgery recovery because it affected the way that I felt taking up space and needing to be taken care of and that fear of being abandoned. So after I had surgery, if I needed something, let's say I needed food or water or I needed to be repositioned, needed help with anything, by the time I was actually vocalizing that I needed that help, it's because I've needed it for a long time. I, I could be hungry and I would wait. I could wait like four hours. I would wait because I kind of assumed that like the people taking care of me would realize that like, you know, oh, Aaron hasn't eaten yet today. Uh, maybe I should ask him if he's hungry. Like, it's not fair that I put them in that position in my mind that I kind of assumed that they would just take that responsibility and take care of me. But that's where my mind went. I, I kind of learned from where I was when I was 17 and being punished for asking for help taught me to just wait to receive help and to just trust the people around me to give me that help and to not burden them by asking. So I wouldn't ask and the people taking care of me would like eat in front of me and drink and do all of their things and like take care of themselves and I would just wait to be asked to be taken care of, which was a me problem. I don't wanna blame other people. I should have communicated that I needed that help. And that's why I'm making this video because I don't want anyone to be in that position that I was in. You need to let the people around you know what you need. That's what they're there for. They've come with you for the surgery to take care of you post-op. Not everyone's going to naturally have that instinct of just knowing like, hey, I'm eating breakfast and this other person who can't move their arms, who I need to take care of, also hasn't eaten breakfast. 
Why don't I make something for the two of us? Not everyone will do that, and that doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means you have to give them clear directions on what you need, when you need it. Um, the next thing is, if I would finally ask for something, if it would be like, I finally ask, like, you know, I'm really hungry, um, could I have something to eat? Or like, I'm really thirsty, would you mind getting me some water? And then I drink that water and I need another bottle immediately because I'm like, I've, I've been thirsty for two hours and I haven't asked you, so could you actually get me another bottle? If the person you are with makes you feel guilty or is like, uh, I'll do it in 10 minutes. Uh, do you really need it right now? Or like, ah, sure. Like, you know, any, any of those sort of passive aggressive um, attitudes, if they do that, you are allowed to tell them that that attitude is making you uncomfortable. You're allowed to tell them that, you know, I would really appreciate you not reacting that way when I ask for your help because, you know, we're here for this right now. We're here for my surgery. I only need this for a week. I'm, you're not going to be my caretaker for the rest of my life. I would just really, really appreciate you comforting me a little more and reassuring me that it's okay and that you don't mind being here and you don't mind doing these things. You need to be able to vocalize that. And as much as I could go back and blame my childhood or my adolescence or any of my past trauma for the reason why I didn't vocalize my needs, I am still the person solely responsible for my ability to communicate. I can't spend the rest of my life saying, well, you know, I have trouble communicating because I, w I was abandoned when I was 17. I'm I can't continue to blame my past trauma forever for my inability to communicate. And I can't use that as an excuse as to why I am not working on my communication skills. It's okay for me to go back and acknowledge and connect those dots like, oh, this was so hard for me because of this past experience. I understand where that came from. But that is not the same thing as saying, well, I can't do this. I can't learn to ask people what I need and be more assertive with my needs and communicate my needs clearly. I, I can't do that because of my past trauma. It's like, you can. You are allowed to do that. You could work on yourself. Only you are able to take back that power. So that's that's what I learned. I learned that it's okay to need help and it's crucial to communicate to your caretaker that you need something. Another thing as a person receiving the aid, I would suggest going with more than one person when you get surgery. This is firstly to give your caretaker a break. So for instance, you might need to be up all night. I had back pain and I kept needing to have my pillow readjusted and I felt bad because it's like five times that this person readjusts my pillow and I'm still in excruciating pain. But I feel bad because it's 3 a.m. and my caretaker hasn't slept yet and all this stuff. If you have a second caretaker, they could swap out. One person could have the day shift, one person could have the night shift. And then maybe there'll be less resentment on their end if there is any at all. And maybe there'll be less guilt on your end because you're not always asking the same person to do the same thing over and over again. So I would really suggest going with two people. And also this way, if one of them ends up being kind of a flop, you have another person to fall back on. I know that it's not always feasible because like travel fees, if you're not having surgery where you live, stuff like that. I understand it's not realistic for everyone, but if you can, if that is an option, have backup plans. Have other people who are there ready on standby, ready to take care of you. I really suggest it. I also suggest that you tell the person who's taking care of you not only how you feel, but what they could be doing to improve your situation. So for me, for example, it would be like, you know, I feel so out of control in this moment when I was post-op. And the only thing I have control over is what I say and what I ask for. And it would mean the world to me and it would really help my anxiety and really help my feelings of not having control if you would just be able to focus on me a little more or if you wouldn't make me feel bad when I ask you to get me things, if you'd be a little more proactive, like what they could be doing to make you take your power back, to make you feel like you have more control over your body. I... <laughs> I was in pain and I couldn't sleep and I couldn't eat and I felt like I couldn't ask for anything and then I just, I had to go to the bathroom and you know, I went to the bathroom and I just remember this moment of like my pants being on the floor and I didn't have the strength to bend down and pick them up but it was like four in the morning and my caretakers had already spent so much time fussing with me and my pillows and trying to get me comfortable and I was in so much pain and me just giving up and letting them go to bed and me being up in pain. and. I just sat there on the toilet with my pants on the floor trying to figure out how how am I gonna pull up my pants and um, that is a mental space that is hard to describe to someone um, that level of vulnerability and loss of power and loss of agency could easily become really traumatic with the wrong kind of support system so you need to make sure you're with people that you know 
You could wake up at any time in the night. That won't make you feel bad. That will reassure you on top of it. Not only will they not make you feel bad, they'll make sure that you feel okay asking them for help. Um, you need that. You deserve to be taken care of post-op and you deserve to feel like it's okay to occupy that space and you shouldn't have to take on the burdens of the people around you. It's not selfish to be the one who needs to be taken care of and to firmly state like, you know what, right now, I can't focus on you. I really need us to focus on me right now. And it's okay if your caretaker can't do that. If you have these conversations with the person before surgery and they're like, you know, I don't think that I'm the person to do this. Or they're actually, if they're offended, if they're upset by the situation, just accept that and realize you can't force someone to be who you need them to be. They have every right to not be the person who takes care of you post-op or to be present, but not be the caretaker. Just because someone is your partner or your sibling or your parent or your best friend, just because they have these labels, you can't force someone to be able to handle something. My girlfriend, who I have presently, I wasn't dating her at the time, but there is no way that she would be able to be my sole caretaker after surgery. Just emptying my drains, she would have passed out. She's really squeamish, and I understand that. I understand that if I ever have surgery, something happens, like, she can't be the one who's taking care of those things. I need someone else. My ideal situation is to have more than one person there. It'll also give your caretaker a break. But that is not her doing me a disservice. That is not an insult to me. That I am not entitled to her having to suck that up. Like, that's not okay. Don't, don't gaslight the people around you into feeling like they're being abusive just by having their own needs. After you've had surgery and you've had this talk with them and they know that this is supposed to be about you, if they start to then like, you know, bring the focus back onto them and not be able to focus on you as the recovering individual and can't help but focus on their own needs, then there's an issue. But if this is before surgery and they're telling you flat out, like, I have too much going on right now, I don't think that I could do this, that's okay. They're allowed to do that. They are just as important as you are, and you're just as important as they are. Everyone just needs to make sure that their needs are met. I also suggest having these talks with the people who are taking care of you before you go for surgery. Let them know what this means. They might not realize what it means to take care of another person, or they may think they realize what it means to take care of another person. They may have taken care of someone else in the past, but that other person isn't you. My caretakers have experience taking care of other people who've had surgery, but those other people who've had surgery didn't have EDS. So their recovery wasn't as difficult as mine. They weren't as dependent on their caretaker as I was. There's, there's a lot involved, but your specific needs are not exactly the same as the needs of others. So really be clear about what you're expecting and what you need from them. And if it seems like they're not the person who's able to do it, or if they even get annoyed or offended by you even having that conversation with them, they're not the person you should be taking with you to have surgery. If the person you're with can't even handle you having a conversation with them about your anxieties and your expectations and your needs post-op, they're not gonna be able to handle it the way that you need them to when you're going through a really rough time and it's 3 a.m. and they need to do everything for you. That's, you know, if they can't handle a conversation, how well do you think they're gonna be able to handle you when you're high on pain medication and in a lot of pain and really not feeling super well, you know? Anyway, that's all. I hope you enjoyed this video. Part two will be out shortly. It'll be about the role as the caretaker and my advice to people who are going to be a caretaker for top surgery. All right, hope you enjoyed this and I hope you take care and thank you so much for watching. All right, bye.